Why do we like motorcycles? Is it because they look cool? Or is it because they're super fast and pop mega dank nooners? Or is it because they make sounds that could moisten the nethers of even the narrow-minded normie? Well, the correct answer was D, all the above, but if you pick the exhaust sounds, well, then I have a surprise for you. Seven motorcycles that you probably have never heard of, or at least you've never heard. Some of these bikes are rare, some of them aren't sold in the United States because, well, we can't have nice things, and some of them cost so much that the closest you'll ever get to one is seeing it in this video. They're not in any particular order, because if they were, it would just be seven Daytonas with different exhaust systems, and maybe an R1 thrown in there for good measure. Instead, think of this as a list of bikes to buy if you want to confuse and befuddle your friends the next time you show up to a group ride, or I guess not so much confuse and befuddle as make your friends jealous of your fantastic wealth and wonderful taste in motorcycles. Let's dive right into today with Suzuki TL1000R. Never heard of this one? Well, me neither. That's why it's on the list. It came out in 1998 and featured a 996cc 90 degree V-twin putting down 135 horsepower and 78 foot-pounds of torques. It is butt ugly, which is probably why it only lasted until 2003. That or the Hayabusa siphoned off all the resources over at the factory. The TLR was a direct shot at Ducati's 916, and Suzuki thought that the bike was destined for glory and the American Superbike Championship. But unfortunately, it was too heavy at 502 pounds wet and ready to ride, so riders defaulted back to the Gixxer 750. If you're looking for a superbike with something a little different under the hood and you don't want to pay an arm and a leg and a testicle to keep it running, the TLR is a great alternative to the Panigale. Plus, you can find clean examples for as low as 3,000 bucks. V-twin superbikes make all the great sounds, but there's something about the early 2000s sport bikes that just sounds so much better. Take a listen. <laughs> In my opinion, the V-Twin Superbike really deserves to make a comeback, and I know Ducatises are out there twirling their mustaches while sipping on a smooth cup of Euro Snob Superiority right now, but if there's one thing Suzuki can do that Ducati can't, it's make an affordable motorcycle. The TLR is from a time when leader bikes had relaxed ergonomics, usable power, and another crazy space-age tech. Sure, it might have benefited from some ABS, but if you need advanced traction control and rider modes to make the bike rideable, maybe you should take a long look at your life choices. Moving on, we've got our first Italian entry, the one you've probably heard of on the channel before, the MV Agusta F3800. In case you've been living under a rock for the last few months, we've got a Reparto Corsa limited edition F3800 in the garage right now, and let me tell you, when you get this thing on the boil on a racetrack, it is so very good. It's packing a beefy 798cc triple, putting down 148 horsepower and 65 foot-pounds of torque. Weighing in at 380 pounds dry, which means it's probably about 410 pounds wet and ready to ride, it's an absolute featherweight. Now, you know Papa Yam loves himself a good triple, and you might be asking why I chose this instead of something like the Moto2 triple from Triumph. Well, if you'll allow me to be blunt for just a minute, Triumph kind of shanked the Moto2 Daytona. It's a glorified street triple RS wrapped in carbon fiber, and it is nice, but I need my sky-high red lines, 150 horsepower, and it just doesn't have that. It's not enough race bike for me. If you're looking for a triple cylinder sport bike and you have $17,000 burning a hole in your pocket, definitely go for the MV. Take a listen to this thing. It handles incredibly, it flicks in great, I had the pleasure of riding one at the racetrack at a very fast pace, and let me tell you, the bike is just magic. Obviously, the main issue with MV Agusas is that their dealerships are very hard to find. And to that one person saying that AF1 racing is just up I-35 down in the comments, Shut up. Try to find an MV Agusta dealership in Chicago, or better yet, find one in Dubuque. They're boutique, bikes, and unless you live in a major city with good riding, have fun servicing your Italian stallion. Now, the only reason we've been able to have this bike in the garage is because all of you guys watching these videos. Unfortunately, it's a loaner, so I can't keep it, but we do have a special secret new long-term loaner coming that we're gonna make a bunch of videos about. And if you wanna know what it is, you gotta join our Discord over on yamanube.co. Not only is it the best place to hang out and talk about bikes, but you'll be able to use the group ride map on the website, watch exclusive weekly live streams, and vote on bikes in the giveaway. Oh, and before I forget, you can win free motorcycles on there. But if you just want a t-shirt and some chances to win, you can head over to yamanubemerch.com and get yourself decked out and head to tow gear. Every dollar you spend is an entry to win. Or maybe you just want to see us turbo the Hayabusa. Well, my friend, we are acquiring the turbo kit as we speak, and only when we reach a million subscribers will we reach the zenith and peak of the Busa Boy Mountain 
then slap that turbo on the bike. It is on you now. <laughs> Subscribe if you haven't and head over to yamanoob.co and check out all the cool stuff we're doing over there. And for everyone who goes the extra mile and supports us over on yamanoob.co, thank you so much. You guys make all this possible. And now for something completely different, the Arch KRGT1. I wanted to put the Method 143 on this list, but believe it or not, there's not that many exhaust clips on YouTube, and those are only super short and not very good. So instead, you've got the KRGT1, the entry-level motorcycle costing only $78,000. You'll get yourself a custom-made cruiser with an absolutely massive 124 cubic inch or 2032cc air-cooled V-twin engine. It's putting down a claim to 121 foot-pounds of torque, which is not that bad, and it's packing Olin suspensions, ISR brakes, and a 538 dry weight. Why would you drop eight stacks on a bike with less power than a Diavel is beyond me, but some folks really love that custom bike feel. What makes this bike sound different than other air-cooled V-twins is that unlike your screaming Stiegel 131 Freedom Machines, the arch is designed for power and performance. It's still a push rod engine, meaning you have crazy valve chatter, and it revs quickly thanks to its massive displacement. It sounds downright mean. Take a listen. Unfortunately, this motorcycle is not for us mere mortals, but if I ever get the chance to rip on one, you know I'll make a video so you guys can live vicariously through me. And hell, I'll make sure that Spike can get a ride on it too because I know he's dying to get on an arch. In the meantime though, enjoy the pictures of it, I guess. Also, unless you're a huge fan of the looks, there are bikes that are just as good for cheaper prices, the FTR or the VMAX, for example. By the way, if anyone in Texas actually owns an arch, please reach out to me. I guarantee you we can make some cool content. I would love to take a look at an arch in person. Next up, we've got our last V-Twin, but this isn't just any V-Twin. It's a small displacement, high revving engine crammed into a supermoto, the Aprilia SX V550. Tied with the Nuda 900 is one of the best sounding supermotos out there, and no, the Hypermotard doesn't count. The SXV put down 70 horsepower and weighed in at 350 pounds. These things are practically unicorns, seeing as though they had a super limited production run, but if you can get your mitts on one, you're in for one of the most unique riding experiences of your life. It's a full-on supermoto with 12 and a half inches of ground clearance and long suspension travel, but it's rolling on 120 17s up front and a leader bike, ridiculous 180 17 at the back, meaning you have grip for days. You can chuck this thing into a corner and just keep leaning until you start dragging the handlebars and you'll still be able to pick it back up and keep going. What's weird about this bike is that it only has a five speed gearbox, but if you're actually using it at a supermoto track, you're probably not gonna need that sixth gear. Sort of like a motocross bike in that way. The SXV is one of those holy grail type of supermotos, a bike that everyone wants, but no one can find. If you're lucky to nab one of these for $5,000, consider yourself lucky because realistically, you're gonna be spending a whole lot more because SXV owners know what they got. Now let's hear what a baby V-twin revving out to 12 and a half thousand RPM sounds like. Now this one is pretty much for everyone but Americans, the Honda CB400 Super 4, a 399cc inline four with VTEC. Tell me that isn't something special. This is basically a smaller version of the CB900F that we had as our very first giveaway bike back in the day with the classic one-piece banana seat, single round headlight, analog tack and speedo, and classic color schemes, but with modern components like a piggyback shock, Nissan calipers, and that Honda reliability. This bike makes 53 horsepower and 30 foot-pounds of torque, and it weighs in at 437 pounds, which is a bit heavy for what it is. But unlike the parallel twin offerings from Yamaha, Kawasaki, and even Honda, the Super 4 sounds amazing both at idle and full song. Take a listen. For those of you who don't know how VTEC works, it's essentially it's a variable valve system that enables and disables the use of some of the valves based on RPM. When you're just poodling around town at lower RPMs, you're getting reduced power, but also reduced noise and fuel consumption. But once you crack the throttle open and hit the twisties, the bikes gives you 100% power and lets you really get after it. The crazy thing is the change in the exhaust note is super noticeable both in the saddle and if you hear it flying by. Next up, we have the Yamaha R7. And no, that wasn't a typo in the script. Yamaha actually did make an R7 at one point. Back in 1999, they created a limited production run of only 500 to meet homologation standards for the Superbike World Championships. It was a 749cc inline four with five valves per cylinder that made 106 horsepower and cost $32,000 at retail. 
I know that sounds comical by today's standards, but remember that the TL-1000R from earlier was also on the showroom floors at the time, and it was only making 135. The line between 600, 750s, and 1000s back in the day wasn't quite as stark as it is now. But Yamaha did have two race kits that could essentially make the bike put down 135 or 162 horsepower if you had a spare $12,000 lying around. The bike was essentially a race bike with lights featuring Olin suspensions, titanium valves, and chassis derived from the YZR 500GP race bike. They only imported 50 to the US and 10 were reserved for Yamaha's race team, which means that if you manage to get your paws on one nowadays, you truly have a one of a kind motorcycle. Let's take a listen. <laughs> Finally for today's list, it's the Honda RC213 VS. Back when Honda had a drinking problem and decided it would be a great idea to make a MotoGP bike for the street and then blacked out and woke up to a motorcycle listed at $184,000 because who wouldn't want to sell all their organs to own a street legal version of Marc Marquez's 2016 bike? Believe it or not, when they released the bike, they capped the RPMs to 9400, meaning the bike couldn't even keep pace with leader bikes that cost 9% of what the RC213 VS did. In stock trim, Honda made a MotoGP bike with a 999cc V4 engine that only made 101 horsepower and 66 foot-pounds of torque. Let me say that again. It was a GP bike. It wasn't a replica that was capped at 101 horsepower and it cost $184,000. You actually needed to buy a race kit which wasn't available stateside to get the full 214 horsepower at 14,000 RPM. Why Honda? What's the point of that other than fleecing another couple of grand out of the pockets of these maniacs? Oh well, if you've got enough cash to buy one of these bikes, chances are you're not even going to ride it. Rather, you're just going to park it in your penthouse apartment and flex every time you have a wine and cheese party. But hey, it does sound absolutely god tier. Take a listen. That's the good stuff right there. The Honda RC213 VS that they made back in the day was a truly special motorcycle. Every component was handmade, and in my opinion, it is worth every single penny of $184,000. It is a special, special bike. And no, the CBR1000 RR Triple R SP RRR does not even compare to this thing. It is not the same thing, and Honda just doesn't get it anymore. Oh well, at least they make the greatest motorcycle of all time, the CBR500R. Fact. Water makes different pouring sounds based on its temperature. Heat changes the viscosity of water, which changes the pitch of the sound that makes when you pour it. Goodbye. Keep watching Yammy Noob. 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 Keep watching Yammy Noob.